and welcome to another episode of Perfect Night In. I'm your host Neil Perryman and today I'm pleased to welcome Steve O'Brien to the show. Steve currently writes for SFX, Doctor Who magazine, Digital Spy and Den of Geek and he's also the co-author of Slayer Stats and Who Graphica, both fabulous books. Right now Steve is living in a tent in a lorry park in Kent and that's where I caught up with him. Hello Steve, how are you? I'm good, how are you Neil? I'm fine, thank you, and thank you for agreeing to share your perfect night in with us. Well, look, you know, I've got nothing to do today, so... Fair enough. Can you explain to us where your perfect night in would take place? It would it would either be in my living room, which uh, has a 55-inch telly, or it'd be in my man cave, among all my kind of Blu-rays and DVDs. But the, I don't know, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm thinking about getting a, one of those digital projectors, but I, I fear that old tv may look worse on it so that's the thing that kind of is stopping you know i mean you know 4k cinematic tv brilliant but uh, i don't know i don't know whether hancock's half hour will look great on a kind of 100 inch screen okay steve so your perfect night in starts at 6 30 and it's a children's favorite Thirty is a bit later than it, it used to be on. I think it used to be on about sort of I don't know ten past five, but it still seems about right. It's grey and chill. Uh, grey and chill at the time. It seemed to be kind of adult TV for beginners. And I, I went to a crappy comprehensive, you know, all be one in Bath. You know, it wasn't exactly the mean streets of North London, but it was still it was still something that I could identify with. And um, so it was sort of like a preparation program for the for the sort of films of Alan Clark, you know, or Alan Bleasdale shows. You know, it, it was. It was it was really radical uh, for its time. You know, a lot of the stuff on BBC around it was, you know, pretty middle class in accent and pretty middle class in attitudes. And usually if you saw working class people in kids drama, they were, you know, they were usually the oikish psychic or, uh, you know, some thicko supporting character. It's amazing to think now that in 1978, somebody like Phil Redmond, who, who you know, wasn't an Ox, you know, an Oxbridge guy with a, you know, spoken RP, this working class scouter was given this prestigious slot on BBC One to make this, you know, punky, snotty little kids show. Not allowed on that table, Jenkins. Yeah, Lars Doily. Come on, Jenkins. You pay for your dinner like us lot. Yeah, that table's for the poor kids and the scroungers. Pack it in, Doyle. It's not my fault my dad's sick. Me dad's sick. Your dad's always bleeding sick, ain't he? He's got what you'll have in a minute, mate. A busted bag. Oh, yeah, and he's going to make us? Me. There isn't a specific episode that I like to see on anything pretty much from the first five five or six seasons uh kind of my era that first series is it's pretty sort of jape heavy it's only with the second series it it starts to sort of say things usually I mean, whether it's about school uniform or shit parenting or, or classroom snobbery you know and then within six or seven years you know it's doing smack addiction um you know in the slot that blue peter usually has you know so I, that's just that's fantastic it's weird though because it was so unloved by the BBC in those final years, and and you know obviously it was it was cancelled when it reached its thirtieth anniversary, you know which I and I remember sort of you know a lot of fans at the time were kind of thinking well you know how, how's the BBC going to celebrate this thirtieth anniversary? We're going to get a reunion? I'm like, no, they're going to cancel the show. But the media seems to have gone like crazy on Grain Chill for this fortieth anniversary, and I just wonder if there's a pitch somewhere in the BBC for like a one-off reunion thing, you know where where the you know the actual characters can be reunited I and mean, you know that's a that's a pretty easy setup it would just be fantastic to see you know and just imagine that you know the, the nostalgia hit that you'd get from that which of the characters did you identify the most with i'm assuming it was tucker jenkins it would be yeah, it would be tucker actually and his kind of replacement characters because like jonah who was kind of in the first year when i was in first year he was the sort of the tucker of that of that uh that intake so i liked him a lot you know my favourite character is probably Gripper. I just thought Gripper was a great sort of hissable uh, villain. You know, he, he's one of, one of the great TV villains. He's up there with, you know, Davros. That evil toe rag should never have been allowed back on school premises. But he was. And in the space of one morning, he's attacked people because of their colour, because of their sex. I also hear you're back to demanding money with menaces, Stepson. What an utter incomplete charmer you are, lad. Okay, Steve, so Grain Chill takes us up to seven o'clock, and your next choice is. Uh, 
Uh, my next choice is uh, Terry and June. Um, I'm actually doing a, a marathon watch at the moment. You know, sorry girls, I'm not single. It's it's just it's one of those programs that that uh, it regularly got about seven about I don't know fourteen times the audience, the young ones, but nobody talks about it now, except as a punchline in sort of shitty safe like you know uh, suffocatingly middle class sitcoms. But there, there's something immeasurably comforting about it. And there's, re- there's, there's rarely any change in it. It, it. I mean, it lasted eight years, but that living room set never changed. Terry never got a promotion. June never... Well, she never really did anything. But uh, the most that ever happened in the arc of Terry and June was that her first neighbours moved out and Tarquin and Melina moved in. Oh, and Terry's work colleague, Malcolm, uh, he, he's got his face changed about, th- about three times due to departing actors. And, you know, look, I, I just really like it. Uh, I, I, find, I think Terry Scott is a really underrated comic actor. I think he's quite brilliant in the show. And um, as is Reginald Walsh, who plays the Dennis, uh, June Whitfield, great, sort of solid, uh, solid comic actress. I think it's a great little show. Have you ever seen It's a Knockout on the telly? It's a knockout, of course not. Oh, we have, Terry. You know we have. It's where teams from all over the country dress up in ridiculous clothes and take part in those hilarious competitions. I thought that was come dancing. <laughs> you do get the occasional stump, as I've learnt on this rewatch, uh, I'm, on, I'm t- towards the end of season three at the moment, you do get the occasional stumble of a politically sort of rocky episode. You know, they, they do the occasional common market uh, dig, and uh, Terry's mild racism, but like Sir Dennis, his boss is just terrible. I mean, a, you know, honestly, he kind of makes Nigel Farage look like sort of Tony Benn or Diane Abbott. You know, he's this frothing Europhile with a picture of Churchill in his office. And um, I was watching this episode recently where he blasts off to Terry about hating the hating the Japs, and, and of course you're not meant to laugh along with that. And uh, and what do you know? It you know a gang of visiting Asian businessmen, all stereotypical, of course, and with no dialogue. Of visiting Terry's house just as Sir Dennis comes to visit. I hope you're not using any garlic or any filthy foreign spices. No, only salt. Mind you, this menu you've planned for Sir Dennis is make him think I'm a very unimaginative cook. Leek soup, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, and spotted dick and custard. Ah, you'll love it. A traditional English menu for a traditional English bigot. Hope he doesn't choke on the French beans. Mm. Oh, if that's him, he's early. Oh. And, and this was written by the guy who played the sweet Tommy in Planet of the Spiders. Yeah go figure but i did learn an interesting fact recently uh now, now there's only really two sitcoms that are set in croydon uh and that's terry and june and peep show and peep show's writer sam bain uh his mother played malcolm's wife bt uh in the show so uh tell your friends okay steve so terry and june takes us up to seven thirty, and a strange time slot for your next choice <laughs> Well, I'm hoping it's dark by this point in time because uh, Twin Peaks kind of suits uh, you know, is a pretty sort of nocturnal show uh, in terms of watching it. It's just got this amazingly seductive quality. Um, you know, to see, liking Twin Peaks seems to go straight to the part of the brain that loves a piece of music, not the bit that likes TV shows or books or films even. And you look at other TV shows of the era and they looked terribly dated either by the production values of the time or the fashions. But, you know, but I don't know, the world of Twin Peaks is this hermetically sealed world. Uh, You never hear any contemporary pop music in it. Uh, There's no obvious fashions from the time. This is a world in which, like, the 1950s never stopped happening. I mean, it's a cliche to talk about something being timeless, but Twin Peaks sort of genuinely was, and it still looks ravishing and cinematic, and visually there's there's nothing else like it. But this this is the episode that kind of pointed the way to what Twin Peaks would be. It's a real sort of sharp left turn episode, because... We're so familiar now with what Twin Peaks is, you know, which is sort of supernatural killers and red rooms and dancing dwarves and stuff. That it's quite easy to forget how, how kind of straight it was in those first couple of episodes. You know, people didn't know what they were getting into. Kind of Lynch waited quite patiently to introduce the weird stuff. And it's in episode three. That's the first little sort of drop of weirdness. Uh, you know, and it's, it's when we Cooper has his dream, uh, which 
which is the first time we see the dancing dwarf in the red room and it's a lynch directed episode and actually he he actually only uh, directed uh, six episodes of the original two seasons and whenever he gets behind the camera it's a it's a massive spike in, in sort of quality and oddness why are we from the birds sing a freshly song and there's the always music in the air so what happens actually it's really at the end of this episode that is uh, is its great uh, sort of a usp um but cooper goes to bed uh the camera sort of zooms in on his head and then suddenly we're in his dream well that's what we're told told at the time actually it turns out that this red room and the, the dwarf and where everybody talks backwards actually is a kind of in inverted commas, real place within the world of Twin Peaks. But for the moment, we just think it's a dream of Cooper's. But uh, this is where he's told who killed Laura Palmer. And the episode ends with him waking up, getting on the phone saying, I know who killed Laura Palmer. Actually, when it when it goes to the next episode, he just says, uh, I forgot. Which is just a brilliantly audacious piece of uh, story writing from uh, David Lynch and Mark Frost. Yeah, it's, 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 a, br- it's a brilliantly directed episode. Uh, and... Uh, was its first little uh, indication of, of how gloriously sort of out there uh, Twin Peaks was going to be. And it would also look great on your projector in Blu-ray. It would, it would. This is the first uh, TV show of the night that really would, actually. So, yeah, maybe that's a reason to get it. OK, Steve, so Twin Peaks takes us up to 8.15, and your next choice is... very British coup. This was a three-part uh, drama on Channel 4 in, from 1988, adapted from the book by Chris Mullin, who was a, a, a left-wing Labour MP. You know, just a kind of regular backbencher. Uh, it's about um, a sort of hard-left uh, Labour leader who actually who becomes uh, Prime Minister, you know, with a, an amazing landslide. Uh, and he's obviously based on Tony Benn, for whom uh, I think uh, Chris Mullin was a great friend, and so he certainly campaigned for uh, uh, for Ben when uh, when Ben was going for the leadership in the early eighties. And it's I don't know, it seems more prescient now than it ever did in nineteen eighty eight. Back in nineteen eighty eight, the idea of, of Neil Kinnock really being Labour leader just seemed pretty far fetched. But it, it seems within the realms of possibility now that Jeremy Corbyn could get in in twenty twenty two, twenty three, whatever, uh, much more than Neil Kinnock uh, ever could or, or Tony Benn. And, you know, like President Bartlett on the West Wing, Harry Perkins, that's the, that's the Prime Minister, he's like this fantasy PM. It, it's, though it's this dark, scary story of the political establishment's indestructibility, there's still something, I don't know, really comforting about the idea of this sort of decent, sharp-brained bloke from Sheffield becoming, you know, the leader of the country. I, I must admit, I, I could have done with maybe some of the other wings of the party to be made a bit less devilish. It's, it feels a bit momentum-y in the way that all the solid hard left members are shown as decent and honourable and all the centre-right ones, you know, the avatars, I suppose, for Dennis Healy and Roy, and Roy Hattersley. They're all portrayed as kind of saboteurs and toys in disguise. Um, and I don't imagine Tony Blair was watching this in 1988 and getting a political hard-on, you know, of this fantasy Labour government. During this campaign, I have been called many things by my good friends from the press and media. <laughs> The Times, our great paper of record, called me a simple-minded fool. Simple-minded fool. Well, so be it. Maybe they're right. For if it's simple-minded to believe that people, all people, are entitled to food, to warmth and shelter, to a good education, a free health service, (laughs) and a well-paid job, then yes, I am simple-minded. But it's a fantastic... Uh, thriller as well as uh, you know a hard-hitting you know political drama and it's just and it's it's a career high performance from Ray McAnally as Harry Perkins and I think actually he died on I think maybe it's only a year or two after this you know it's a really kind of sad loss it's a brilliant teleplay by Alan Plater uh, it's a fantastic cast uh, a young Keith Allen is in it as his as Harry Perkins is a uh, sort of Alistair Campbell spin doctory figure uh, although they wouldn't ever call him a spin doctor in this. Tell us about the truth, Mr. Thompson. Well, let's start with what we already know. The power workers' strike is an attempt to stitch you up personally, prove you're out of touch with the people, the usual kind of crap. Well, I think I knew that. Lad. No, personally. 
They're not out to force a general election. You've been in power for one year, you've got an overall majority, they ask for an election, you're just going to turn around and say bollocks. It's a fantastic show, and uh, I, you know, if, if only, I don't know, if only the it had been made a, on a sort of 60... Five mil or something, you know. It, you could imagine it would be repeated now, but you know, being made on that sort of rather grainy kind of sixteen mil kind of rather consigns it to the dustbin of vintage TV. So you know, I can't imagine that we're going to get a Blu-ray of it, or it's going to be repeated on Channel Four at nine p.m. But yeah, you know, if you're interested in politics, yeah, definitely seek it out. I think it's time for some snacks. Have you brought some favourite snacks with you, Steve? I'll have a couple of lion bars and uh, and a haribo i think because uh, i'm going to be naughty tonight and i i know it's kind of what nine-year-olds eat but uh I, I want to i want to recapture my youth tonight round trees lion bar bite it crunch it chew it because it's become a tradition on the show and um, what's your favorite flavor of monster munch uh roast beef yeah british Okay, Steve, it's nine o'clock. As you're munching down on your lion bar, let's start your next choice. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Yeah, this is a... a two-part episode of Cheers, which actually is really kind of one episode, because I think it was shown as one episode when it was screened over here. So it's a double, I think of it as a double-length episode. And it's basically, it's Woody, Woody's wedding. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty atypical episode, because it mostly takes place outside of the bar, and on one set. Essentially, it's a, like a filmed West End, Brian Ricks kind of farce, only funny with really good lines. Um, I loved, I love, love, love Cheers. It's probably my favorite sitcom uh certainly it's in my top five tv shows of all time um there's a there's a warmth there um that i I love love frasier but frasier doesn't quite have the 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 toastiness of cheers and there's something you know so pleasurable about spending 25 minutes after free friday back then you know in this amazing looking waterhole you know the kind of which i would just die for over here uh with these collection of wasters and losers and weirdos and um I only really got into it with Kirstie Alley's arrival. So it, it's weird. I see those first four Diane seasons as almost like a prologue when it's, you know, it, it took a long time to kind of find its feet. You know, but like it seems getting rid of Diane, which of, which obviously got rid of the Sam and Diane relationship thing. Um, it just allowed the other characters to grow. And so it became a proper ensemble when Rebecca joined. I just hope it's a short wedding. I can't wait to get to that cake. I'm starving. <laughs> So I gather the preparations for this event have been somewhat lavish. Somewhat? We are talking about the wedding of the year. Look at this guest list. Tycoons, philanthropists, European royalty. The kind of wonderful crowd that I could be mingling with right now if Robin and I had stayed together. Which, of course, we didn't. He went his way and I went mine. And the dream ended. And that was that. Was that. <laughs> and now I've got to go over there and schlep booze so those rich pigs can pour it down their ugly throats. <laughs> Life sucks. <laughs> okay to call on you for a wedding toast? You know, and all those other characters that were kind of just background colour before her, but suddenly they were they were they, they bloom uh, you know, in the in the Kirstie Alley years. It's just great when you're scrabbling around looking for a favourite character and you realise you can't choose one because they're all so brilliant and vivid and irreplaceable and memorable. I don't know, just watching Cheers, you feel it it's like it's the comfort of eating, you know, or drinking in your favourite pub, whereas Frasier's more, more. It's, it's more upmarket that you feel as though you ought to dress up for it. But they're all, they're all. What I love about it is they're all lost people who only seem to find themselves, you know, their their sort of family at that that bar. Actually, re, their real families in Cheers are usually shown as I don't know, just a, sort of warts and all. You know, there's no solace for people at home. They they find their companionship and they find their their family at the, at this bar. So I don't know. I think when you're when you're 18 and you just, and you want to be in pubs all the time and you hate your family, uh, that's that's you know important thing to see. So what is it about this specific episode? Uh, I I think it's just I mean just in terms of the rate of laughs, it's like it, as I said, it's like a it's like a stage farce. Uh, it's just the, the 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 energy in it and the pace in it. 
Okay, now if we can get the body in the wine cellar and a and Frazier to fix Uncle Roger, and uh, Rebecca to fix the cake, and Lilith to entertain the guest, and Cliffy to fix Woody's pants, and we'll be all set. Femi, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but the uh, body seems to have fallen off the dumbwaiter. Oh, gee. Just when everything was going so well. <laughs> it's just an amazing piece of TV. It's the episode I, I tend to show people when I need to sell cheers to them, even though, actually, it's quite atypical. But I don't know, certainly from a British perspective, a viewpoint this was just like classic farce of the kind that kind of john cleese could have written it you know it's a it's a brilliant brilliant uh 45 minutes and your next choice is a another comedy of sorts It's another comedy, and it's also another uh, programme from 1988 called A Very. So there's a very British coup, and I've got a very peculiar practice. This is, this kind of basically follows the exploits of a sweet, idealistic, rather bewildered GP as he joins the medical practice of a rundown uh, sort of Red Brick University, played by Peter Davison, by the way. And this is the final episode, which is, I think, the high point of the series. It's a proper final episode, and it's beautifully sort of apocalyptic and uh and dark and pointed and furious and it and it, i find it sort of continually heartbreaking that andrew davis who you know admittedly is still working hard and and is still in his 80s but you know is still producing you know uh, a lot of stuff that he he's he's rarely done a kind of original drama he's got it, this show has got such a strong authorial voice it's furiously satirical, it's screamingly funny, and it's dark, and it's odd, and it's surreal. And yet Andrew Davis seems happiest adapting you know, other people's works. You know, he's, he's the go-to man if you want your Jane Austen or George Eliot or, or Charlotte Bronte novel sort of adapted. And um, this show e- only even you know, existed, really, actually, because he owed the BBC money, I, I think it was. So he kind of wrote it quickly and just pay off a debt. Right, two a day, plenty of liquids, early nights. Off you go, Mr. Smallcock. Miss Goiter for Dr. Buzzard, please. Smallcock? Not cock. Oh, go away! It makes me quite angry, actually, that uh, the, the show is sort of talked about, you know, it's, this show is quite held in quite high regard by us little sort of telly geeks. But um, I have a feeling that kind of to the, the, the sort of Guardian writers who talk about quality TV, who tend to think it all started with The Sopranos, that it's a bit of an unknown uh, gem. Uh, I did show it to an ex-girlfriend actually about 15 years ago, and to her it just looked. It, she actually said she, it looked like a stage play. I have a I have a feeling that kind of TV of this vintage just looks bewilderingly stagey and sort of grey to, to people sort of raised on HD and the vivid colours of sort of cinematic TV. Now we have a crisis here. Vitamin deficiencies, malnutrition, bronchitis, pleurisy, pneumonia, you name it. I actually saw my first case of what they used to call trench foot this week. I've also got six cases of severe clinical depression. Six. And they're just the serious ones, the ones I'm going to have to refer. And I think Jock is right. This crisis is the direct result of policies pursued by this administration. The students can't afford to buy books, eat or pay the rent. And no matter how hard they work, half of them expect to be thrown out at the end of this term. Well, that'll get the numbers down a bit to roll on next term, eh? This is the TV programme that um, convinced me to go to university. Oh, really? Oh, really? In fact, actually, you should be able to tell me more than anybody, actually. Did uh, did, did the prophecies that Andrew Davis make uh, come, come true? You know, you worked at uh, universities in the 90s. Absolutely. I mean, I left uh, academia probably because of the prophecies that came true. So it's very bittersweet watching a very peculiar practice back because it's such a bleak ending. It is. And it's a, it's a, it's rather a shame, actually, that he kind of did that little coda uh, film with a very Polish practice, which uh, I know he intended that to be a series, but uh, for some, for various reasons it didn't happen. I don't know. I just think his, his 
more pointed focus was actually on the on the world that he actually knew and he was an ex-university lecturer so this was you know very close to home for him uh i, I think that uh, a very polish practice rather suffers from having too little to say he places himself in the narrative as well doesn't he the actual character he the does writer, is in there he does he's uh, ron rust uh which makes it you know meta before the word meta was a thing and peter davison is fantastic in it and and i, I wish i wish tv now cherished peter davison in the way that um, they did in the 1980s he's so good in this and he's i mean he's my favorite doctor anyway but uh, but i think his performance as this doctor stephen dacre is is even greater than that you know i, I you know if uh, if big finish wanted to you know make more of these i'd be happy i still cherish him yeah i know you do it's um past the watershed now so i think it's time for a drink what can i get you Ooh, if it's Christmas or near to Christmas, I think I'll have a Bailey's. But uh, if it's a normal night, uh, I think I'm going to just have a Vimto. I, I think I want to keep a clear head uh, for this evening. And when I drink, I just start zoning out. Here's a Vimto that you can bring. Think you've got problems? Well, look at me. It's 10.35 and the next programme could easily drive you to drink. Of the Downing Street years, uh, suitably late so the kids don't see. Uh, there, there was a tradition of BBC and ITV at the time of t- making these sort of epic political documentaries. You know, I remember ITV did one on uh, ITV. You know, yeah, them did one on Kinnock that was, uh, you know, three parts. Now it would be at most like an hour and a half on BBC Four. But Thatcher, you know, because she was on the throne for so long you know seemed to be worthy of, a, of an epic four-part documentary i think it was produced by hugh scully from from the antiques roadshow if memory serves but this is a, a fantastic sort of time capsule when the wounds for her are still really fresh so she's still pissed off i was just amazed at the mixture of bile and treachery that poured out in a speech every word of which had clearly been carefully drafted and in a speech which he delivered if I might say so better than any other speech I'd ever heard him deliver and everybody was still alive you know all the people who have since died like Jeffrey Howe and um, and the the whole thing the, the whole backstabbing thing is still pretty raw for everybody and it's a fantastic uh, sort of record of that tumultuous time and I remember that there was a BBC Two series of around the same time on the Watergate uh, scandal. I, and that was five parts. Again, they managed to get virtually all the main players, who most of whom are now dead. And it's just amazing that, uh, that and, and sad, really, that, that the BBC doesn't invest in these big epic documentaries anymore. You know, PBS do. You know, you'll get uh, you get like a sixteen-part Ken Burns uh, Vietnam uh, documentary, but for homegrown political stories or current events i don't know that seems to be something that's very much in the past now but this was a this was a great documentary and uh you know any anybody interested in politics should watch uh, a very british queue and this at half past six the cabinet parade began that evening only four cabinet colleagues offered their unqualified support the rest advised her that she was unlikely to win Ken Clark came in in his usual robust, rather bruising style, sat down and said the whole process was farcical, uh, that he personally could support me for another five or ten years. But most of the cabinet thought I would lose, and therefore uh, I should stand down and let John Major or Douglas Hurd stand, either of whom had a better chance of winning than I did. So quite a depressing subject matter, but a happy ending. Do you remember where you were when Thatcher went? Yeah, weirdly enough, I was at a, uh, I was doing an evening class. I was doing a politics A-level 
uh, and I and they were teaching me about I think Clement Attlee while this was going on, and I actually said, "Why am I even here?" doing this when the biggest political drama of the century is happening in real in real life and they wouldn't let us out for it outrageous it's getting close to midnight steve and it's time for your final choice hello my name is ben elton it's amazing what a shave and a decent suit can do for you and then i don't want to tell you about the last resort which is due back friday nights on channel four very soon watch it my final choice is the last resort with jonathan ross which i think used to be shown about this time. It, it was the first chat show I'd ever seen that seemed to be aimed at me. I know it's fashioned pretty much around the Dave Letterman show, but in 1987, like, hardly anybody in the UK had even heard of Letterman. I certainly hadn't, uh, let alone seen this show. But um, the last resort would be this place where you'd get Hollywood A-listers like Donald Sutherland just mixed in with these oddballs and misfits like, I don't know, Lloyd Kaufman, you know, who's the head of Troma Films. I remember him, him being on there and serious guests like John Pilger and it was just this great sort of melting pot. Now there's some I'm sure who might, uh, might disagree with you point blank anyway but who might feel that now that we actually are involved in a war mm. regardless of, of how that came about whether that is right or wrong we are in a war so therefore the reporting should concentrate not an analysis of how we got there but yeah. actually what is going on out there. Now, now what do you think of the standard of reports that are actually coming back from the Gulf? It's very difficult, it's impossible. I wouldn't go out there. It seemed to be this microcosm of what Channel 4 was in the 1980s and it just felt a bit contraband, you know, that there was this thing that only a few people knew about, you know, late night on Channel 4. I, I, just, I don't know, I just missed that, that old Jonathan Ross when he'd be given the money to make these passion project programmes, like the incredibly strange film show and that Steve Ditko documentary he did. I don't know, the Saxgate controversy seems to have neutered him. And you kind of think, if, if Jonathan Ross isn't about being cheeky and irreverent, you know, what's he about? You know, I watched that ITV show and first of all, he can't get the guests of, of Graham Norton, you know, and, and he's not talking to the people who interest him anymore. You know, back when you felt as though he was choosing these people and wanted to get Terry Gilliam on to, and they could geek out together about Monty Python or, uh, or, or you know, or trauma films or some kind of weird, uh, you know, left field musician. You know, that, that was Jonathan Ross at its best. And, uh, you know, I kind of I, I miss that guy. And, and, and this show uh, I, I remember I remember he had Graham Chapman on just before he died that was a that was a great thrill in fact I think he had all again he had all the Pythons on because he was such a big Python fan Graham thanks for coming on it's nice to see you and uh, I've been watching the Python repeats on BBC One oh, yes. do you watch them at all the old shows yes I do it's uh, sort of rather a long time ago now isn't it it's as though it's done by someone else because that was a time when you were, you were drinking a considerable amount, wasn't it? Oh, more than considerable. Was it, it was, what, three or four pints a day it was of gin? Of oh, gin, yes. <laughs> yes. That's, uh, that's, well, yes. That's quite a lot. Those are the days. Did you, did you mix with anything, or did you...? Uh, tonic, occasionally. So, so it's about, it's about uh, three crates of tonic a day, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. I always loved it when he had a, a star the Carry On song. I was such a big Carry On junkie at the time, that, uh, and he obviously was as well, and it was just a chance for him to sort of Geek, geek out, you know, in front of um, Barbara Windsor. Of course, this was before he became the sort of pal of every A-lister. So he's still kind of very much in kind of sort of wide-eyed fanboy mode, you know, uh, when he's got his heroes on. And uh, yeah, again, I miss that. And you're not going to get that when he has, I don't know, Jack D on or, um, you know, some bland uh, American pop star. So let's take a look at Steve O'Brien's Perfect Night In. In Grange Hill at 6.30, Gripper Stepson gets his comeuppance at last. And that's followed by mildly racist shenanigans in Terry and June at 7. The world takes a funny turn in Twin Peaks at 7.30, before the landmark drama A Very British Coup premieres at 8.15. There's a feature-length episode of Cheers at 9, closely followed by the final episode of A Very Peculiar Practice at 9.45, when we ask, can Peter Davison's doctor survive the death of a university? At 10.35, it's the conclusion of Thatcher, the Downing Street years, when the Iron Lady finally reaps what she sowed. We wind down at 11.50 with The Last Resort, as Jonathan Ross welcomes his guests, Graham Chapman and Barbara Windsor. And that's Steve O'Brien's Perfect Night In. OK, Steve, I've got one final question for you, and that is, who would you choose, living or dead, to spend your perfect night in with? Well, if the family were away, 
uh, I don't know, I probably somebody that I could myself geek out with. Uh, so about so maybe Frank Skinner. I feel as though he's one of us. I feel as though he'd he'd get it. Maybe even Jonathan Ross himself. Uh, you know, but only if he could guarantee to to be on his worst behaviour. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Hooray, you made it to the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please tell your friends. And if you want to help out with the running costs, which will also convince my wife to allow me to spend more time on this nonsense, please visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash perfect night in. Thanks.